My name is Bree. And my name is R, and welcome to our first episode of Queer Science. Thank you to everyone who has supported this project so far. We are truly amazed by the outpouring of support we received for the first podcast centered around queerness in STEM. Our podcast will elevate queer voices in STEM and will take a deeper look at the ways in which science itself can be queer. This first episode explores the importance of visibility in STEM, going beyond diversity and inclusion by working towards a more just science. When discussing this topic, R and I both knew right away who we needed to interview, and that person was Dr. Jamila Simpson. We had the opportunity to sit down and ask her about her role at NC State University, the importance of researching diversity in STEM, and her own personal experiences as a Black woman in science. So my job at NC State is, first of, first of all, it's a long title, but um, I'm Assistant Dean for Academic Programs, Student Diversity, and Engagement for the College of Sciences. And basically what that means to me is I am there to support students who want to study science and to help them find resources, connect across campus, and really just support them in being their best selves, whatever that looks like. And um, I am actually also a graduate of the college. And so someone did all those things for me. They were an amazing role model. They're still in my life. And so I feel absolutely privileged to also be in that role for, gosh, I think there's almost 4,000 students in the college. And I don't know all of them, but uh, I'm there to support as many as possible. So that's my role. Dr. Simpson has a bachelor's in meteorology from NC State, in addition to a master's and PhD in science education. Her research specifically focused on informal science experiences of Black children and their families. During our conversation, Dr. Simpson reflected on her experiences as a Black woman doing science at a predominantly white institution, and how she decided to study education. I came in 1995. I was the only Black person in my meteorology classes, and one of the few in my other classes, especially in math and science. And I had a lot of great role models, a lot of great upperclassmen. I had an office like the office I kind of <laughs> I try to, to, to have that's really welcoming and, you know, put students first. And when I graduated undergrad in 2000, my mentor told me, you're the first black woman to get a BS degree in meteorology. And I told her, no, that, that, that can't be true because it's the year 2000. <laughs> and she said, no, I think that's true. And uh, I didn't believe her. So I called the research, like uh, the office that does statistics for the university mm -hmm. to double check. And uh, they told me that that was true, that I was the first. And uh, you just have one of those moments where you're excited and you're devastated at the same time that you're the first in anything, especially at that late time. Because I knew even though I was the first to finish, I was not the first to start. And no one in the department said anything to me about this. <laughs> it was, you know, it was my mentor who was in, worked in the college, but the department never said anything to me about like, wow, this is a, you know, a huge accomplishment. You're the first one that's come through the program or or anything like that. But the numbers are so small that I know, I know all the other black women who have come through the program. Like, and we're, we just made it to like the, the second hand, but there's, there's honestly like six of us so far. There's not, there's not a lot. That's how rare it is. You know, for me, what, what I want to be in a student's life, because this is what I had is, you know, if this is your dream, if this is your passion, if this is what you want to study, I don't want, I don't want the obstacles of what other people think, those obstacles that institutions don't even realize that they're creating for students. I want to help mitigate those as much as possible that so students can be who that they, they want to be uh, in the world. I'm just still amazed by the whole no one told you thing. Like, just the, the, 
impact that would have had like going into it like I'm still shocked that no one mentioned that especially with such a small like program like meteorology yeah. Yeah. like it's the unspoken reality like yeah. if someone had commented on that like that part still kind of shocked me when you're talking about it and so while I was taking my science ed courses I read an article and it was like the status of black students in science. And it talked about how black students get uh, tracked out of STEM. And it talked about how if they don't get tracked out, how the ones who make it through are usually the only one. And I, I read the article and I was really, it was like, I was reading my life. I'm like That's me. This is, this is me everywhere. And then I realized you can do research on this. But that's what, what changed my heart to, I'm just going to get this master's and work at the science museum as the tornado lady to whatever, whatever I do, I'm going to work on diversifying science. The Draw a Scientist test is an activity that Dr. Simpson has done in her classes for several years. It shows how pervasive scientist stereotypes are and how often they are reproduced in the media we consume. So the Draw a Scientist test was created in 1983. Their the idea ideas of what a scientist that, looks like. What you imagine, the jobs and how people look in those jobs is, you know, whether you match that or not, ask a student to imagine a scientist and then draw that scientist and draw as, as, in as much detail, you know, what does the science look like that they're doing? What does the scientist look like themselves? And what they found was that most people drew older white men with goggles or glasses doing chemistry with explosions and lab coats and just a very stereotypical image of a scientist. When they've interviewed people, they found that most people get those images from media. And it starts very young. And so like a lot of stereotypes, it starts so young that you don't even recognize that you form those stereotypes. And so I do that with my class. So I teach a class for underrepresented freshmen. And so I do this test with my class when we're transitioning to begin to talk about diversity in, in, in STEM so that they can reflect on how their subconscious is really viewing a scientist. I will say that my students have begun to draw more women over time or draw themselves, which I really appreciate. I love when I see them draw themselves because for me, that is one of my greatest concerns is that they don't see themselves in science. Honestly, not seeing myself in science has been my entire experience so far in higher education. I started off at community college because I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I got my associates in art and science still didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I loved science and learning things and figuring stuff out since I was a kid. And it was hard going into science classes and not seeing someone that looked exactly like me. And that was a little discouraging um, because you sort of realize over the course of time that as you're looking at stuff, you're learning things that maybe people like me don't contribute to science. Maybe people like me aren't meant to be in science. They aren't meant to be studying these kinds of things. And that can be really, really discouraging and really hurtful. And it's not necessarily intentional. It's not like the professor is specifically saying to me, like, you don't belong here. Although that clearly happens, it's a more subtle way to say that you don't belong here. And so it's just sort of a, it's another barrier that you face going forward in higher education and academia and wanting to be a researcher, a professional scientist, or even just learning things as a hobby. It's another barrier that you face because it's another way you're told that you're different and you don't belong. I've certainly felt as being a queer student, definitely that I feel like the only one. And I play this game where I sit in class and I'm like, you're queer, you're queer, you give off queer vibes. And then 
the moment you find out that a professor you have is actually queer is like the most exciting moment of your entire life. Diversity and inclusion are two words we hear often in academia, but what do these words mean? What is the difference between diversity, inclusion, equity, and justice? So diversity is difference across lots of different areas, right? You want to make sure that you're bringing people of all different backgrounds into all sorts of different experiences, that's uh, different areas of study. Inclusion is, well, you don't just want those people in your group, but you want them to feel like they're actually welcome in the group, actually fully a part of the group. And so it's it's up to us to create those environments in which they feel a part of it, they feel respected, they feel welcomed. So, you know, there's a quote about diversity being invited to the dance and inclusion being invited to dance. Equity is where you're talking about like uh, the fair treatment of others you're giving, you're making sure everyone has access and opportunity. That doesn't mean you're treating everybody the same. And sometimes people get caught up in that, that, you know, everyone's like, everyone's experience. I have to do the same for you and you and you No, because if you really have a diverse group, then they have diverse needs. Justice is where we deal with the barriers they can be present or historical that are keeping groups from having full access to those spaces. And all of those things take intention. You have to be intentional about it. You know, with everything that's going on in the world right now, specifically, I think we've been in a place where people are like, yeah, diversity and inclusion, but it's the equity and the justice that people haven't been so intentional with. And so you know, I, I, I kind of love that people have been putting out these statements because now if you put out a statement, I get to hold you accountable mm-hmm. to creating these just spaces, mm-hmm. right? Because you told me <laughs> that you were against, yeah. you know, structural inequality. Well, great. Now, don't let's not just talk about out there, but let's talk about in here, you know, where we are, what we have control of. In April of 2018, Angela Davis gave a keynote speech at Chapman University in which she posed the question, what about justice? We can be included within an institution that remains as racist and as patriarchal as it was before we were included. This quote resonates with me because sometimes I feel like I see queer representation in STEM, and then I'll see someone produce a body of research that actively harms the queer community. So I'm like, yeah, we might be included in STEM, but how are we changing how science is done? Who's asking the questions? And see, this is the hard part because now we have to go beyond who's invited to certain spaces and actually step back and look at how that space was built. It's too important. And I, I, it's so hard to do the work of diversity and inclusion and then work in systems that are unjust. That is because you don't want to just, again, like you don't want to just perpetuate the harm over and over and over to students that you care about. And, and not just students, but like, and as, as, as communities, we have to do this together. Because there's some barriers like, yeah, we're aware of because of, you know, uh, let me give an example, standardized testing. That's a barrier. That's really a test of your income. It's really not a test of how successful you're going to be in college. They don't want to address like the structural inequalities of who's getting paid. They don't want to talk about who's tenured and who's not, how much are grad students making? And it's like, I don't care. Bree, it, it, it's, it's talking about what you just said. It's like, how is your classroom? How'd you set up that space? How is, how, what does your syllabus look like? You know, what are you, what are you saying in the syllabus? Are you saying that you want to know pronouns and that you'll utilize those pronouns, that your office is safe? Are you on the uh, the university uh, advocate list? Like, what are you doing trainings? That's what that looks like. 
every single day. When you talk about scientists in your classroom, are you inclusive with that list of scientists? Do they look like everybody? You know, when you're asking students to do research, are you opening it up to everybody or just someone that reminds you of you? This past academic year was the first time that I had multiple instructors that actually asked my pronouns, asked what name I wanted to be called by like, and respected that and made that as just, like, an assumed thing. Like, it was as simple as asking, like, what is your name? Mm -hmm. Like, like, what's your name? What's your, like, year? What's your pronouns? And what's your favorite color? Like, Mm -hmm. that was the icebreaker thing for the class. And so it was, it was one of the first times that I've actually had multiple instructors just include that as part of the status quo. And it felt so revolutionary and radical at the time, especially for, like, me not experiencing that until, like, I'm 25, and that's the first time that's happened. And can I tell you, I've been interviewed so much, and people, um, when I say interviewed, it'll be like, like I did the Diversity in STEM Symposium, and people will say, why Diversity in STEM? And I have to justify why that's important. And so I can't wait till the day I don't have to justify that anymore. Because honestly, and it, it's, it's really a ridiculous question if you think about it. The world is diverse. So if you have spaces that aren't diverse, your spaces are biased. Why do I have to justify? <laughs> like I should... If anything, it should be reversed. They should be justifying how they can create spaces that aren't inclusive. <laughs> they they know what what their they know what it should look like. They absolutely know what the population looks like. They know it should look like this. So either one of two things, they have said to themselves, "This is this in, this is inherent in these populations that they don't have access to science or they don't want it or whatever," or they have to say. We've messed up the system and we have to look at the system that we created and the harder work is looking at the system that they created because especially in higher ed and and especially in STEM, they're so, they're like the experts, they are the experts and there are, there are answers and the, you know, and they feel comfort in that and this is maybe not the expert, uh, area they're an expert in, and that's uncomfortable. And they have to do some different kind of thinking and some different kind of work, and that's uncomfortable. But it's okay. Let's get used to being uncomfortable. But let's do it. Let's do the work. And I've had people who don't want to hear that at all. I'm, I, told, I told a coworker one time that they were biased, and they were so offended. And I was like, they were so offended. But I was like, you have to own that. Because if you don't own it and don't look at it, you're not going to change. And they're like, well, that's never good if someone tells you you're biased. I'm like, we're all biased. And that's another thing. (laughs) I don't want to say we're all biased to let people off the hook for holding on to their biases. (laughs) You're biased and you have to do the work to unlearn it. That's the work you have to do. You have to own it and, and work to undo it. In science, we are often taught that bias equals bad and objective equals good. But in reality, it's hard to be objective when asking certain scientific questions. I feel like sometimes we forget to look back and see who is asking the questions. How does that shape the questions being asked? We want to think science is unbiased and objective, and certainly not political. But sometimes that's not necessarily true. As an adult, you realize where the the research was going or not going where the funding was going or not going. And then you begin to see like the political implications. And so, you know, if, if, if science is honest, science knows it's not apolitical and it knows it's not always objective. It it knows it because there's nothing that we work on that doesn't intersect politics in some kind of way. Like let's stop perpetuating the notion that, human beings haven't politicized science and how and let's not ignore the 
impact it has had disproportionately on certain populations. Science has a lot of responsibility to bear for all these communities feeling like it doesn't belong to them. Mm -hmm. Because when science, you know, there's, there's like, there's science of just like, I understand the world. I'm learning about the world, right? There's that science. And then there's the formalized way we do science. And a lot of communities were participating in science before it got this very formalized way of being. Mm -hmm. And all, I feel like all that happened was, you know, it, it just became this very upper class, rigid a way of sifting out who does real science and who doesn't. Mm -hmm. And so over time, we've, we've had to begin to like, like break that down. And I think in that people knew they didn't see their culture and the way it was being perpetrated. Right. Mm -hmm. And we were also, we weren't saying, Oh, cooking science. We weren't saying that at that time. We as in like science as a whole. And so we were making people give up their cultural way of being to be a part of science, their identities. And we were telling them, like your family and the way you've done it doesn't count. It's only what we've done. We've published, we've defined. So hundreds of years of that. Yeah. We've got a lot of people, lower income, first gen, different uh, genders, ethnicities and orientations who don't see themselves at all because that's the, the system was set up. So they didn't see themselves in it. I feel like in this podcast, we talked a lot about justice and science. How do we make science more just? And to me, I think making science queer or creating a, a so-called queer science is a just science. And I think it's because it ties back to the word queer itself. To be queer is to, to challenge a heteronormative status quo, a heteronormative society. And it is being queer, which is a term I think that has gone back and forth because it was clearly an offensive term for quite some time, but now it's being reclaimed. But in being queer, we can empower ourselves in saying, we are, do we are challenging that system. We don't want to be included in that system. And we want to exist in our own system and we are proud of it. And we have created the system and it works and it is just. And so for me, I feel like sometimes adding that queer aspect to science, like a queer science is a more just science because we are saying, we are changing that system. And it, it's paralleled, I think, too, or, or works in conjunction with decolonizing science. Uh, you know, are you going to bring an anti-racist feminist perspective to science and things like that? So I don't know what your thoughts are on uh, queer science. Uh, sort of like the term decolonizing or making a just science. Like queerness is so broad that it's hard to have one definition or one correct perspective but i agree that queerness is being othered it's being pushed aside there's a standard that you're not being a part of you're not being that cis heteronormative person that society expects you to be and so if you're not a then you can be b c d e f keep going in the alphabet like but if you're not a that's the important thing and I think reframing and restructuring a system so that you acknowledge all the other letters and all the other numbers and the other symbols and other languages is the important thing. That instead of it being the system, if you're not A, then you must be B. Of being, if you're not A, then it's okay to be B. It's okay to be C. It's okay to be a combination of all of the above of reframing and restructuring a system you allow spaces for all of those different identities to exist. And I think the root of that being queer is a way to encapsulate that differentness, that being unique, being against the system. So it's hard to define and I don't have a working definition of it. It's not something that like, you can go in the dictionary and look up a definition, but it encapsulates more than that. It means way more than those words could ever represent. And so for me, queerness changes day by day as my experiences change. But I think in general, it means 
that you're not part of the standard, you're not part of the norm, and challenging that idea of, well, why is there this norm? Why can't there be a space for everyone to exist as they want to? Being queer is creating a new system because the system that existed was not benefiting you and was harming you. And the same can be said about science. Science can harm certain communities. And it's on us. Yeah, it has. And it's on us to be more just, to make science more queer, to create that science that empowers those of us that are marginalized rather than just ignoring that it marginalized us altogether. (laughs) This isn't the end of talking about justice and science. Our conversation with Dr. Jamila Simpson was only one small moment in the larger discourse that we as scientists and everyday people need to be having. We'll keep exploring the importance of justice, empowerment, and accessibility in science in further episodes. Thank you everyone for listening to the first episode of Queer Science. Be sure to check us out on Facebook at Queer Science, Twitter at Queer underscore Science, and Instagram at Queer underscore Sci. The Queer Science team believes that educational content should be accessible to all, and we are a small team of 20-somethings working to bring this podcast to our audience for free. If you like our work, consider supporting us at patreon.com slash queer science. You can also donate to the Queer Science GoFundMe to help us purchase equipment and cover production costs. Check out our website too at queerscience.show.